and I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, if I'm not projecting loud enough, please do just let me know um, so that you can all hear. Um, as Stephen said, we are going to talk about portfolios today, and since I'm involved with the Mahara project, being the community lead and also the main uh, community facilitator. Um, all the examples that I'm going to show you today are Mahara based. And that doesn't just have the reason for me being involved in the Mahara project, but also because Uni of Waikato, as Terry already mentioned earlier, is using Mahara itself. Uh, Stephen has been using it for a number of years already, or um, the Faculty of Education, um, on myportfolio.school.nz, so that teachers Teachers can be in the exact same, or teacher students can be in the exact same space that they'll be working in once they graduate. But from this term on, um, the university will also have its own Mahara instance, and Stephen can update us on that later with URLs, how you log in, and things like that. And so that's why we thought it would be good to give you some examples of what other tertiary educators around the world do with ePortfolios. And today the focus really is on tertiary education, because as far as I know, the main or the most of the audience will be from tertiary education. Do we have somebody else here from another area, from a school or from a hospital or DHB? Primary school, fantastic. Um, there will still be things in there for you, even kind of ideas of what you as professional can do with an e-portfolio. We won't be looking at um, what kids can create as e-portfolios, but grab me during afternoon tea and um, I can tell you a little bit more about that. But before I continue speaking, I'd just like to know a little bit about where you're coming from and also kind of find out what you already know about ePortfolios. And since we do have a quite a large group in here, I'd like for you to turn to your neighbor, ideally somebody you don't already know. So please look around to your left, to your right, in front of you or behind you. And um, just for a minute and a half, um, talk to each other what you already know about ePortfolios. Don't be shy if you haven't heard the word before, don't really know what it means in the educational context, but just briefly talk to each other and find out about yourself. And then we'll dive into the examples. <laughs> Yeah, so it seems like you are really all doing very well talking already about e-portfolios, maybe also some other things to each other. And so I think the second session um, that we have planned right, right before lunch will actually be a really, really good one. Even though we have three presentations, three short ones, um, you might still be able to kind of also um, tell us a little bit about your experiences. And so I've just kind of been monitoring the sound level in this room. <laughs> and it gets very close to the noise in an airplane, which on the airplane is really bad when you're at 80 decibel or above, because that's really not good for your hearing. But in a, in a room like this, it's actually really fantastic, because it means you're talking to each other, you're sharing information, you're sharing knowledge, and you're connecting with each other, all the very important things that we know we kind of should be doing today and that help us learn ourselves and also improve our learning and teaching. So I'm thank you very much for all your conversations and I hope you've got some new context, some new points of interest and things to look up afterwards. While I'm going through the examples that I've collected, and it's not an exhaustive list of examples, we are kind of looking only at about nine different use cases today. Please do shout out if you have an example yourself, or if you're not so much in the shouting game, you can also just type in the link um, in the Google document, or also the uh, um, what you use ePortfolios for, so that we can then kind of look at those things later on as well most likely in the second session. So what I've gathered, as I already just said, um, are just some examples of how ePortfolios are used, especially in the tertiary sector, and also with the view of career and career development. So the first one I'd just like to look at, and that's more of a generic one though, but a really, really important one, is online identity. Because we all know 
we are we, but how do we tell somebody else who we are, what we do, and how do we portray ourselves, either personally or also professionally? How much do we divulge on a public Twitter account versus in a private Facebook account that is only open to friends? How do we manage all our social interactions? And in this case, the ePortfolio can really help with that to portray yourself, in particular in this case, as a professional, to show off what you are, who you are, but not with the view of actually getting a job, which we look at later in the career portfolio, but more, who are you? So if somebody wants to invite you to a conference, for example, they can find information on you. Is it the right information that they can find about you? And things like that. And so this is an example here, and these slides are available online. I'll uh, tweet them out later. So they are all open examples. Sometimes that's quite difficult to get because not everybody likes to share their portfolios openly. But in this case, all the examples, you can look at yourself later on again. So this is an example of a graduate student at Pace University in the United States. Um, close to New York and she's talking about herself and her experiences where she's come from where she's at at the moment and where she is going to be um, in the future what her plans are so she's giving us a good understanding of herself Unfortunately, we won't have time to look at all the particular items in the portfolio, so just um, don't worry if you can't read some of the text. Another example is from the University of Bolton, because there one of the lecturers said, um, lecturers have lives too. And in this case, um, I can't show you the portfolio itself, but he did submit an article for our quarterly newsletter in which he says, well, my students do know me from my classes and they <coughs> kind of know what I do academically, but I kind of, I'm a bit more than that. I'm also human. So I do want to show that as well and show them what I do in my past, uh, spare time and what I'm really into and what I like doing. So that you, again, not just look at the person as the person standing in front of you, but also there's more to that and you might want to connect with them as well in different ways. So he has a blog, he's very much into sustainability, for example, and that of course also influences his teaching and his thinking in what he does in the classroom. So the e-portfolios are more than just a multiple choice quiz or just a resume that you have online because it really digs deeper a lot of times because you can be personal with the use of media in particular. You can show off who you are because all the things you do are very different from somebody else. And that brings us to a very different project now, namely how you can use e-portfolios with students. Ellen Marie Murphy wrote a really nice book a few years ago, um, the Mahara Cookbook, in which she discusses 52 different scenarios of how e-portfolios can actually be used, especially in education. And one of them was for student projects and writing a newsletter. And so Scotland's Rural College, um, the Barony Campus One, um, with Ali Hasty at the forefront, they decided to try one of those ideas out themselves. So they created a newsletter project. They started writing a newsletter collaboratively that they are then publishing with the students and they use a Mahara collection for that. So e-portfolios don't have to be individual pieces of work or pieces of work by individuals. You can also work on these things together. You can create projects together and present these then to the world or just to your campus. And here the students work together in order to bring, um, bring to the forefront a newsletter that they, um, with all the important things that they find are uh, useful for them that they want to, know uh, want to let others to know about. We can also use it directly in the classroom. And a very long-standing example is actually for language competency. 
Um, in particular in Europe, the language portfolio um, has quite a history already, not just at, less so at university, but kind of already starting in primary school and then secondary school. There are lots of templates out there. And of course, in the beginning, it got started with a paper portfolio. But these days, people use more online resources for that and put it online. Because in the language, you have to show your competencies, you have to show your skills. You can't just say, here yeah, I got an A or an B, but it's kind of good for other people to know how you speak, um, how proficient you are, and things like that. And so a portfolio is very well suited for that because you can put the actual evidence into the portfolio itself. You can include audio files, you can include video files. For example, outside of the university context, but kind of local here to Hamilton, Ronja Skandera <coughs> from Hamilton Girls College, she has been using portfolios in her language classrooms, having the girls submit um, speeches and group work uh, together in a video or as an audio file, and then she takes that, puts it through Audacity, which is an audio um, player and recorder, and then speaks her comments. So similarly to what Terry does with his video, um, voice marking, she does the same for the language classroom. And the nice thing is the students then also hear the pronunciation in the language. So she doesn't have to try to explain it and use um, the phonetic alphabet and then still not know if the students get it, but they can actually hear her pronounce the things correctly. And that's where the power of online tools comes in and putting all that into a portfolio, having everything in one place really helps. Coventry University, unfortunately I can't show you an actual portfolio there, uses it um, with students in pre-sessional English classes. So the students, international students that come to university want to study but aren't proficient in English enough to actually follow the courses, they go to these pre-sessional classes and encounter e-portfolios because there they can use e-portfolios to reflect upon their learning. They use journals for that, um, use them on a regular basis. They can also create short videos in English, either individually or even as groups, and therefore interact with each other, speak. The lecturer can hear what their pronunciation is, make uh, give tips on how they can improve, and then also document their development and progression in their writing skills. So you have a lot of different tools available in an e-portfolio to help you uh, gain more competencies and skills. And you always have the evidence right there. You're not just, or the student or another lecturer is not just relying on somebody saying, well, this is worth an A, and then another lecturer comes, well, this is worth a B or a C. But if you, act, if you have the power to look at the evidence, you can also make up your own mind and say, well, yes, for me, that is enough of what I need, or I'll um, give suggestions to the student in other ways. And then continuing with the theme of assessments and assignments, since we are now in the classroom, there are, of course, lots of examples for portfolios as well. Um, Mahara, interestingly enough, didn't really start out to do assignments and assessments because that's what we have the LMS for. So the universities here in New Zealand that started the Mahara project back in um, 2005 with the project proposal and then 2006 with the actual development work decided not to do a lot of um, the functionality that an LMS like Moodle can do and replicate that in the ePortfolio, but really make the ePortfolio complementary to an LMS. The LMS is the space of the teacher, of the instructor. You have full control, or at least most of the time, um, which sort of form posts or forms you set up, what the students can post, when the students can post, how many assignments they need to upload, and things like that. And the e and the ePortfolio was considered to be the space for the students. So like a personal learning environment, which kind of goes back to the digital identity, how do I present myself, what do I want to do in my portfolio. But of course, over the years, um, and the more e-portfolios also came into education, assessments do come to the forefront quite a bit. And we do see more of an influx for that or also a need for that. So we do build um, tools into that that do help with assessment. Or you can connect um, your Mahara to your Moodle instance, for example, and then share the rubrics, work with your Moodle assignments, but still have the students create e-portfolios. 
and other tools are more into working with, e um, with <coughs> assessment strategies depending on the ePortfolio software. But just an example, again from Scotland's Royal College, they actually just won an award for that. Again, they've already won a award for their newsletter project, and now they've won one for their assessment project. And um, unfortunately, that was just open yesterday for me to look at. Um, but don't despair, it should still be online, hopefully under another link. So what they do is um, they have a so-called graded unit. Um, they are veterinary college, and so the students do work um, quite a bit with their e-portfolio. And let's take this one then. So here we see the Partech team, and that is similarly to New Zealand, lots of uh, learning technologists working together with instructors. And you can read through the entire project yourself and kind of find the um, examples. What I'd just briefly like to show you is an example of a portfolio. And some of their student portfolios are online. And here you can also see they start personalizing it more, so it's not necessarily that the identity of the university has to be uh, taken over for the portfolio, depending on how your system is set up. And so the students plan, ev uh, plan their assessment tasks, and they also work with these pages and work through them and use them also as kind of project reports. And so sometimes essentially you could say they set up a small website with easy to use tools, everything is contained within the university. Another example, this is uh, more for the, for reading and research later on is University of Victoria in Canada that um, has been using Mahara to explore how to create powerful learning opportunities in, in changing learning environments and also personalizing learning environments. So if you're l more interested in those things, then you have a bunch of articles freely available here that you can also read up on and see how they are using it. Um, they, for example, also work quite heavily with videos, which they annotate, so they, they put the transcripts on and use those then also within their teaching, in particular for teacher education. Research progress. An e-portfolio is very well suited, of course, as most of you will know, for development, seeing where you've been at A, where you are now, and where you might want to go at the end of a term, and also reflecting on things. And so Wendy um, Holyburn from Messe University thought, well, what a good idea to try that out in my research project. So she actually set up a portfolio um, for her PhD research materials. She collects everything in there or links to her resources that are elsewhere online and shares that with her supervisor. And so they have one central space where they can go for all her research material and she can then take things from there and put it into her writing. Now we are getting more, a little bit more into the career track, kind of leaving the student life behind or almost behind and looking at how can an e-portfolio actually also help them in the future. And so one way is to also use it for internships. And the University of Caen in France, for example, uses it for apprentice e-booklets. And in this case here on this page, they describe what these look like, but we also have a couple of examples that you can take a look at and we can practice our French a bit. Oops. And so the students kind of talk about themselves, what they are working at. Oftentimes they also just um, talk about the workplace, historical things about it and so on, and then what they are doing um, in their internships. And so this is a way again for them to reflect on their work and tie it in with the rest of the work they do at uni. And um, that kind of leads perfectly into the career portfolio. Um, oftentimes that's kind of the portfolio we know, especially from artists. 
they walk around with these big papers and kind of take them to a gallery and say, hey, I want to, ex want to exhibit, <laughs> do you like my work? And so they can look through their portfolio and see, yes, this is something we are interested in, or architects the same. And now we can also do that more in education or in other areas. For example, with us in soft, uh, software development, we always want to look at the code that somebody wrote to know, well, how good it is, is it? Do how many other languages do they speak, kind of computer language, software, uh, programming languages, and so on. So the evidence is actually always very important. And so at Pace University, for example, this is um, one idea of how one of their students landed a job through their portfolio once he's gotten to the interview stage. Because then the interviewer just has a much richer idea about who is sitting in front of them. They can imagine more what that person is like, how they work with others, if they've been collaborating on other projects before, and so on. So you get a more rounded picture of a person. Southampton Solent University, so if you are interested in kind of setting up portfolios like that, um, that talk about employability or help your students with employability, there you actually have some information and resources of how you could get started. So you don't have to start from scratch. Of course, like we heard this morning, you can always Google and find a lot of things there as well. Um, or you can go to these open resources already and see what others have done successfully. And speaking to an audience at a university, tenure and promotion is always really important. And so you can use a portfolio for that as well. Um, one very successful tenure application process was by Keith Lender from Purchase College, also in New York. And um, he, instead of using the normal university forms that all of his other colleagues were using, he decided to create any portfolio for his tenure application and also make it openly available. So he's been a very good example for being an open scholar and talking about his teaching, his learning, and what he's experienced. And Pace University is going also to implement a tenure pro portfolio and under that YouTube link you can listen to them and hear kind of um, the ideas that they are going through and the processes and how they are going to set it up. But leading into our next session, which will start in a few minutes, just one last idea of how you can use ePortfolios here on campus or at your institution if you're not from the university and that can be professional development. And not just your professional development, but also the pro professional development of your students. Because first example here is by Megan, who is a, sorry, who is a, or who was a graduate student, she's now graduated, from Pace University. And she created a portfolio to show off what she has done professionally. Yes, this looks very similar in some ways to the digital, um, or the digital identity one, but in her case, she really focuses on her professionalism and not so much on her personal life. And she created it because she saw it presented on her campus by one of the interns and got interested in actually starting it on her own. So there wasn't even a lecturer telling her to start it. Another example, which seems to be very popular because Stephen is going to tell us about, uh, about his experience for that, is the CMELT application. Um, that is, we'll hear all the details later on, so I'm not going to take his thunder. Just want to show you that there are other people also doing exactly the same thing that Stephen is doing. And this one is, for example, by a language instructor at the University of Warwick, uh, Theresa McKinnon. And she has been working with portfolios for many years already, uses it with her students for various different purposes, internships and tr field trips abroad, and also for her own um, application into a professional association. And funny enough, a second one does the same thing from Australia. Um, Colin, he uses a slightly newer version of Mahara, that's why his portfolio looks different. Um, he also did his CMELT application directly in Mahara, structures it differently, shows it off differently than Teresa does. And after the break, we'll see what Stephen does and what his motivation was for doing that in an ePortfolio.